Rebels and the Raj, The Revolt of 1857, and its representations, Theme 11. Late in the afternoon of the 10th of May, 1857, the sepoys in the cantonment of Meerut broke out in mutiny. It began in the lines of the native infantry, spread very swiftly to the cavalry, and then to the city. The ordinary people of the town and surrounding villages joined the sepoys. The sepoys captured P, the Bell of Arms, where the arms and ammunition were kept and proceeded to attack white people and to ransack and burn their bungalows and property, government buildings, the record office, jail, court, post office, treasury, etc., were destroyed and plundered. The telegraph line to Delhi was cut. As darkness descended, a group of sepoys rode off towards Delhi. Figure 11.1. Portrait of Bahadur Shah. The sepoys arrived at the gates of the Red Fort early in the morning on the 11th of May. It was the month of Ramzan, the Muslim holy, month of prayer and fasting. The old Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah, had just finished his prayers and meal before the sun rose and the fast began. He heard the commotion at the gates. The sepoys who had gathered under his window told him, We have come from Mirat after killing all the Englishmen there because they asked us to bite bullets that were coated with the fat of cows and pigs with our teeth. This has corrupted the faith of Hindus and Muslims alike. Another group of sepoys also entered Delhi and the ordinary people of the city joined them. Europeans were killed in large numbers. The rich of Delhi were attacked and looted. It was clear that Delhi had gone out of British control. Some sepoys rode into the Red Fort without observing the elaborate court etiquette expected of them. They demanded that the emperor give them his blessings. Surrounded by the sepoys, Bahadur Shah had no other option but to comply. The revolt thus acquired a kind of legitimacy because it could now be carried on in the name of the Mughal emperor. Page number. 289, through 12 and, the 13th of May, North India remained quiet. Once word spread that, Delhi had fallen to the rebels, and Bahadur Shah had, blessed the rebellion, events moved swiftly. Cantonment after cantonment, in the Gangetic Valley, and some to the west of Delhi, rose in mutiny, one, pattern of the rebellion. If one were to place, the dates of these mutinies, in chronological order, it would appear that, as the news of the mutiny, in one town travelled, to the next, the sepoys there took up arms. The sequence of events, in every cantonment followed, a similar pattern, 1.1 how the mutinies began. The sepoys began their action, action action with a signal, in many places, it was the firing of the evening gun, or the sounding of the bugle. They first seized the bell of arms, and plundered, the treasury. They then attacked, government buildings, the jail, treasury, telegraph office, record room, bungalows, burning all records. Everything and everybody connected with, the white man became a target, proclamations in Hindi, Urdu and Persian, were put up in the cities, calling upon the population, both Hindus and Muslims, to unite, rise and exterminate. The Firangis. When ordinary people began, joining the revolt, the targets of attack, widened. In major towns like Lucknow, Kanpur and Bareilly, Money lenders and the rich also became the objects of rebel wrath. Peasants not only saw them as oppressors, but also as allies of the British. In most places, their houses were looted and destroyed. The mutiny in the sepoy ranks quickly became a rebellion. There was a general defiance of all kinds of authority and hierarchy. Bell of Arms is a storeroom in which weapons are kept. Ferangi, a term of Persian origin, possibly derived from Frank from which France gets its name, is used in Urdu and Hindi, often in a derogatory sense, to designate foreigners. Figure 11.2. Ordinary people join the sepoys in attacking the British in Lucknow. 290 page number. In the months of May and June, the British had no answer to the actions of the rebels. Individual Britons tried to save their own lives and the lives of their families. British rule, as one British officer noted, Collapsed like a house made of cards. Source 1. Ordinary life in extraordinary times. What happened in the cities, during the months of the revolt, how did people live, through those months of, tumult, how was normal life affected? Reports from different cities, tell us about the breakdown, in routine activities, read these reports, from the Delhi Urdu Akbar, the 14th of June, 1857. The same thing is true for vegetables, and sarg spinach. People have been found, to complain that, 
even kadu, pumpkin, and bangan, brinjal cannot be found in the bazaars, potatoes and avi, yam when available, are of stale, and rotten variety, stored from before, before, by far-sighted, cundrous, vegetable growers, from the gardens, inside the city, some produce, does reach a few places, but the poor and the middle class, can only lick their lips, and watch them, as they are earmarked for the select, there is something else that, needs attention, which is causing a lot of damage, to the people, which is that, the water carriers have stopped, filling water, poor surface, gentility, are seen carrying water, in pails, on their shoulders, and only then the necessary household tasks, such as cooking, etc. can take place, the halorkas, righteous, have become hiramkas, corrupt, many mahalas, have not been able to earn, for several days, and if this situation continues, then decay, death and disease, will combine together, to spoil the city's air, and an epidemic will spread, all over the city, and even to areas, adjacent and around, read the two reports, and the descriptions, of what was happening in Delhi, provided in the chapter, remember that newspaper reports, often express, the prejudices of, the reporter, how did Delhi Urdu Akbar, view the actions of the people, 1.2 lines of communication, the reason for the similarity, in the pattern of the revolt in different places, lay partly in its planning, and coordination, it is clear that, there was communication between the sepoy lines, of various cantonments, after the 7th Award Irregular Cavalry, had refused to accept, the new cartridges, in early May, they wrote to the 48th Native Infantry that, they had acted, for the faith and awaited, the 48th's orders, sepoys or their, emissaries, moved from one station to another, people were thus planning and talking, about the rebellion. 291. Page number. Source 2. Sistan and the Tasildar. In the context of, the communication of the message, of revolt and mutiny, the experience of Francois Sistan, a native, Christian, police inspector, in Sitapa, is telling, he had gone to Saharanpur, to pay his respects, to the magistrate. Sistan was dressed in Indian clothes, and sitting cross-legged. A Muslim Tasildar from Bijna, entered the room, upon learning that, Sistan was from Awad, he inquired, what news from Awad? How does the work progress, brother? Playing safe, Sistan replied, if we have work in Awad, your highness will know it, the Tasildar said, depend upon it, we will succeed, this time. The direction of, the business is in able hands, the Tasildar was later, identified as the, principal rebel leader, of Bijna, what does this conversation suggest about, the ways, in which plans, were communicated, and discussed, by the rebels, why did the Tasildar regard, Sistan as a potential rebel, the pattern of the mutinies and the, pieces of evidence that suggest, some sort of planning, and coordination, raise certain crucial questions, how were the plans made, who were the planners, it is difficult on, the basis of the available documents, to provide direct answers, to such questions, but one incident provides clues, as to how the mutinies came, to be so organized. Captain Hirsi, of the Awad military police, had been given protection, by his Indian subordinates, during the mutiny. The 41st Native Infantry, which was stationed, in the same place, insisted that, since they had killed all their white officers, the military police should also kill, Hirsi, or deliver him. As prisoner to the 41st, the military police refused, to do either, and it was decided that, the matter would be settled by, a panchayat composed of native officers, drawn from each regiment Charles Ball, who wrote one of the earliest histories, of the uprising, noted that, panchayats were a nightly occurrence, in the Kanpur Sepoy lines, what this suggests is that, some of the decisions, were taken collectively, given the fact that, the sepoys lived in lines, and shared a common lifestyle, and that, many of them came from the same caste, it is not difficult to imagine, them sitting together, to decide their own future, the sepoys were the makers of their own rebellion, mutiny, a collective disobedience, of rules and regulations within the armed forces, revolt, a rebellion of people against, established authority and power, the terms revolt and rebellion can be used synonymously, in the context of the revolt of 1857, the term revolt refers primarily, to the uprising of the civilian population, peasants, zamindars, rajas, jajadas, while the mutiny was of the sepoys. 292 page, 1.3, leaders and followers, to fight the British, leadership, and organization, were required, for these the rebels sometimes, turned to those, who had been leaders, before the British conquest. One of the first acts, of the sepoys of Meerut, as we saw, was to rush to Delhi, and appeal to the old Mughal emperor, to accept the leadership, of the revolt. This acceptance of leadership took, its time in coming. 
Bahadur Shah's first reaction was, one of horror and rejection. It was only when some sepoys, had moved into the Mughal court, within the Red Fort, in defiance of normal court etiquette, that the old emperor, realizing, he had very few options, agreed to be the nominal leader, of the rebellion. Elsewhere, similar scenes were enacted though on a minor scale. In Kanpa, the sepoys and the people, of the town gave Nana Saab, the successor to, Peshwabaji Rao II, no choice save P, to join the revolt, as their leader. In Jhansi, the Rani was forced by, the popular pressure, around her, to assume the leadership of, the uprising. So was Kunwa Singh, a local zamindar, in Ara, in Bihar, in Awad, where the displacement of, the popular Nawab Wajid Ali Shah, and the annexation, of the state were still very fresh, in the memory of the people. The populace in Lucknow celebrated, the fall of British rule, by hailing, Burgess Kadar, the young son of the Nawab, as their leader, not everywhere, were the leaders people of the court, Ranas, Rajas, Nawabs and Talakdars. Often the message of rebellion, was carried by ordinary men and women, and in places by religious men too. From Mirat there were reports that, a fakir had appeared, riding on an elephant and that, the sepoys were visiting him frequently. In Lucknow, after the annexation, of Awad, there were many religious leaders, and self-styled prophets, who preached the destruction of British rule. Elsewhere, local leaders emerged, urging peasants, zamindars and tribals to revolt. Shah Mal mobilized the villagers of Pargana, Berout in Uttar Pradesh. Ganu, a tribal cultivator, of Singpam, in Chotanagpur, became a rebel leader of the coal tribals, of the region, region. Ninety-three page number. Two rebels of 1857, Shah Mal. Shah Mal lived in a large village, in Pargana Berout in Uttar Pradesh. He belonged to a clan of Jat cultivators, whose kinship ties, extended over Chorazi Des, 84 villages. The lands in the region were irrigated and fertile, with rich dark, loam soil. Many of the villagers were prosperous, and saw the British land revenue system, as oppressive. The revenue demand was high, and its collection inflexible. Consequently, cultivators were losing land to outsiders, to traders and moneylenders, who were coming into the area. Shah Mal mobilized the headmen, and cultivators of Chorazi Des, moving at night, from village to village, urging people to rebel, against the British. As in many other places, the revolt against the British, turned into a general rebellion, against all signs of oppression, and injustice. Cultivators left their fields, and plundered, the houses of moneylenders, and traders. Displaced proprietors, took possession of the lands, they had lost. Shah Mal's men attacked, government buildings, destroyed the bridge over the river, and dug up metalled, roads, partly to prevent government forces, from coming into the area, and partly, because bridges and roads were seen as symbols of British rule. They sent supplies to the sepoys, who had mutinied in Delhi, and stopped all official communication, between British headquarters and Meerut. Locally acknowledged as the Raja, Shah Mal took over the bungalow of an English officer, turned it into a hall of justice, settling disputes and, dispensing, judgments. He also set up an amazingly, effective network of intelligence, for a period the people of the area felt that Firangi Raj was over, and their Raj had come. Shah Mal was killed in battle in July, 1857, Malvi Amidala Shah. Malvi Amidala Shah was one of the many Mulvis, who played an important part in the revolt of 1857. Educated in Hyderabad, he became a preacher, when young. In 1856, he was seen moving from village to village, preaching jihad, religious war, against the British, and urging people to rebel. He moved in, a palanquin, with drumbeaters, in front and followers at the rear. He was therefore popularly called, Danka Shah, the Malvi with the drum, Danka. British officials panicked, as thousands began following the Malvi, and many Muslims began, seeing him as an inspired prophet. When he reached Lucknow in 1856, he was stopped by the police, from preaching in the city. Subsequently, in 1857, he was jailed in Faisabad. When released, he was elected by the mutinous, 22nd Native Infantry as their leader. He fought in the famous Battle of, Chinhut, in which the British forces under, Henry Lawrence, were defeated. He came to be known for his courage and power. Many people in fact believed that, he was, invincible, had magical powers, and could not be killed by, the British. It was this belief that, partly formed the basis of, his authority, 294 page, number, figure 11.5, Henry, Harding, by Francis, Grant, 1849, as Governor-General, 
Harding, attempted to modernize the equipment of the army. The Enfield rifles that were introduced initially used the greased cartridges the sepoys rebelled against. 1.4 Rumors and Prophecies Rumors and prophecies played a part in moving people to action. As we saw, the sepoys who had arrived in Delhi from Meerut had told Bahadur Shah about bullets coated with the fat of cows and pigs and that biting those bullets would corrupt their caste and religion. They were referring to the cartridges of the Enfield rifles which had just been given to them. The British tried to explain to the sepoys that this was not the case but the rumor that the new cartridges were greased with the fat of cows and pigs spread like wildfire across the sepoy lines of North India. This is one rumor whose origin can be traced. Captain Wright, Commandant of the Rifle Instruction Depot, reported that, in the third week of January, 1857, a low-caste Kalasi, who worked in the magazine in Dum Dum, had asked a Brahmin, sepoy for a drink of water, from his lota. The sepoy had refused saying that, the lower caste's touch would defile, the lota. The Kalasi had reportedly, retorted, you will soon lose your caste as air, long you will have to bite, cartridges, covered with the fat of cows and pigs dart, we do not know the, veracity, of the report. But once this rumor started no amount of assurances, from British officers could stop its, circulation and the fear it spread among the sepoys. This was not the only rumor that was circulating in North India, at the beginning of 1857, there was the rumor that, the British government had, hatched a, gigantic conspiracy, to destroy the caste and religion, of Hindus and Muslims. To this end, the rumors said, the British had mixed the bone dust of cows and pigs into the flour that was sold in the market. In towns and cantonments, sepoys and the common people refused to touch the atta. There was fear and suspicion that the British wanted to convert Indians to Christianity. Panic spread fast. British officers tried to allay their fears but in vain. These fears stirred men to action. The response to the call for action was reinforced by the prophecy that British rule would come to an end on the centenary of the Battle of Plassey. On the 23rd of June, 1857, rumors were not the only thing circulating at the time. Reports came from various parts of North India that chapatis were being distributed from village to village. Page number 295, a person would come at night and give a chapati to the watchman of the village and ask him to make five more and distribute to the next village and so on. The meaning and purpose of the distribution of the chapatis was not clear and is not clear even today, but there is no doubt that people read it as an omen of an upheaval. 1.5. Why did people believe in the rumors? We cannot understand the power of rumors and prophecies in history by checking whether they are factually correct or not. We need to see what they reflect about the minds of people who believe them, their fears and apprehensions, their faiths and convictions. Rumors circulate only when they resonate with the deeper fears and suspicions of people. The rumors in 1857 begin to make sense when seen in the context of the policies the British pursued from the late 1820s. As you know, from that time, under the leadership of Governor-General Lord William Bentinck, the British adopted policies aimed at reforming Indian society by introducing Western education, Western ideas and Western institutions. With the cooperation of sections of Indian society, they set up English medium schools, colleges and universities which taught Western sciences and the liberal arts. The British established laws to abolish customs like Sati, 1829 and to permit the remarriage of Hindu widows, on a variety of pleas, like misgovernment, and the refusal, to recognize adoption, the British annexed, not only Awad, but many other kingdoms and principalities, like Jansi and Satara. Once these territories were annexed, the British introduced their, own system of administration, their own laws and, their own methods of, land settlement, and land revenue collection. The cumulative, impact of all this, on the people of North India, was profound. It seemed to the people that, all that they, cherished, and held sacred, from kings and socio-religious customs, to patterns of landholding, and revenue payment, was being destroyed and replaced by a system, that was more impersonal, alien, and oppressive. This perception was, aggravated, by the activities of Christian missionaries. In such a situation of uncertainty, rumors spread with remarkable swiftness. To explore the basis of the revolt of 1857, in some detail, let us look at Awad, one of the major centers where the drama of 1857 unfolded. Discuss. Read the section once more and explain the similarities and differences you notice in the ways in which leaders emerged during the revolt. For any two leaders, discuss 
why ordinary people were drawn to them. Page number 296, resident was, the designation, of a representative, of the Governor General, who lived in a state, which was not under direct British rule, subsidiary alliance, subsidiary, alliance, was a system, devised by Lord Wellesley, in 1798, all those who entered into, such an alliance with the British, had to accept, certain terms and conditions, a, uh, the British would be responsible for, protecting their ally, from external, and internal threats, to their power, b, in the territory of the ally, a British armed, contingent, would be stationed, c, the ally would have to provide, the resources for maintaining, this contingent, d, the ally could enter into agreements, with other rulers or, engage in warfare, only with the permission of the British to, a ward in revolt, 2.1, a cherry that will drop into, our mouth one day, in 1851, Governor General, Lord Dalhousie, described the kingdom of Awad as, a cherry that, will drop into our mouth one day, five years later, in 1856, the kingdom was formally, annexed to the British Empire, the conquest happened in stages, the subsidiary, alliance had been imposed, on Awad in 1801, by the terms of this alliance, the Nawab, had to disband, his military force, allow the British to, position their troops within the kingdom and act in, accordance with, the advice of the, British resident, who was now to be attached, to the court, deprived, of his armed forces, the Nawab became increasingly, dependent on the British, to maintain law and order within the kingdom, he could no longer assert, control over the rebellious chiefs, and talakters, in the meantime, the British became increasingly, interested in acquiring, the territory of Awad, they felt that, the soil there was good for producing, indigo and cotton, and the region, was ideally located to be developed, into the principal market of Upper India. By the early 1850s, moreover, all the major areas of India, had been conquered, the Maratha lands, the Dobe, the Carnatic, the Punjab and Bengal. The takeover of Awad in 1856 was expected to complete a process of territorial, annexation, that had begun with the conquest of Bengal, almost a century earlier, 2.2, the life was gone out of the body body. Lord Dalhousie's annexations created disaffection in all the areas and principalities that were annexed, but nowhere more so than in the kingdom of Awad in the heart of North India. Here, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was dethroned and exiled to Calcutta on the plea that the region was being misgoverned. The British government also wrongly assumed that Wajid Ali Shah was an unpopular ruler. On the contrary, he was widely loved, and when he left his beloved Lucknow, there were many who followed him all the way to Kanpur singing songs of lament. The widespread sense of grief and loss at the Nawab's exile was recorded by many contemporary observers. One of them wrote, the life was gone out of the body and the body of this town had been left lifeless. There was no street or market and house. Which did not wail out the cry of agony in separation of Jan I. Alam page number 297, one folk song bemoaned that the Honourable English came, and took, the country, Angres, Bahada, Ain, Mulk, Lilinho. This emotional, upheaval was, aggravated, by immediate material, losses. The removal of the Nawab led to, the dissolution, of the court, and its culture. Thus a whole range of people, musicians, dancers, poets, artisans, cooks, retainers, administrative officials, and so on, lost their livelihood. Source 3 The Nawab has left, another song mourned, the plight of the ruler, who had to leave his, motherland, noble and peasant all wept together, and all the world wept and, wailed alas, the chief has, bidden, adieu, to his country and gone abroad, read the entire section and discuss why people mourned, the departure, of Wajid Ali Shah, 2.3 Farangi, Raj and the end of a world, a chain of grievances, in a word linked prince, Talakta, peasant and sepoy. In different ways they came to identify Farangi Raj with the end of their world, the breakdown of things they valued, respected, and held dear. A whole complex of emotions. 298 page number. A whole complex of emotions and issues, traditions and loyalties worked themselves out in the revolt of 1857. In a word, more than anywhere else, the revolt became an expression of popular resistance to an alien order. The annexation, displaced not just the Nawab. It also dispossessed, the Talakdas of the region of the countryside of Awad, was dotted with the estates, and forts of Talakdas, who for many generations had controlled, land and power in the countryside. 
Before the coming of the British, Talakdas maintained armed retainers, built forts, and enjoyed a degree of autonomy, as long as they accepted the suzerainty of the Nawab and paid the revenue of their Talaks. Some of the bigger Talakdas had as many as 12,000 foot soldiers, and even the smaller ones had about 200. The British were unwilling to tolerate the power of the Talakdas. Immediately after the annexation, the Talakdas were disarmed and their forts destroyed. The British land revenue policy further undermined the position and authority of the Talakdas. After annexation, the first British revenue settlement, known as the Summary Settlement of 1856, was based on the assumption that the Talakdas were interlopers, with no permanent stakes in land, they had established their hold over land through force and fraud. The summary settlement proceeded to remove the Talakdas wherever possible. Figures show that in pre-British times, Talakdas had held 67% of the total number of villages in Awad. By the summary settlement, this number had come down to 38%. The Talakdas of southern Awad were the hardest hit, and some lost more than half of the total number of villages they had previously held. British land revenue officers believed that, by removing Talakdas they would be able to settle the land with the actual owners of the soil and thus reduce the level of exploitation of peasants while increasing revenue returns for the state. But this did not happen in practice. Revenue flows for the state increased but the burden of demand on the peasants did not decline. Officials soon found that large areas of a wild were actually heavily over -assist. The increase of revenue demand in some places was from 30 to 70 percent. Thus neither Talakdas nor peasants had any reasons to be happy with the annexation. Page number 299, source 4, what Talakdas thought, the attitude of the Talakdas was best expressed by Hanwen Singh, the Raja of Kalakanka, near Rebeli. During the mutiny, Hanwen Singh had given shelter to a British officer and conveyed him to safety. While taking leave of the officer, Han Wen Singh told him, Sub, your countrymen, came into this country and drove out our king. You sent your officers round the districts to examine the titles to the estates. At one blow you took from me lands, which from time immemorial had been in my family. I submitted. Suddenly misfortune fell upon you. The people of the land rose against you. You came to me, whom you had despoiled. I have saved you. But now, now I march at the head of my retainers to luck now to try and drive you from the country. What does this excerpt tell you about the attitude of the Talakdas? Who did Han Wen Singh mean by the people of the land? What reason does Han Wen Singh give for the anger of the people? Thus neither Talakdas nor peasants had any reasons to be happy with the annexation. The dispossession of Talakdas meant the breakdown of an entire social order. The ties of loyalty and patronage that had bound the peasant to the Talakta were disrupted. In pre-British times, the Talakdas were oppressors, but many of them also appeared to be generous father figures. They exacted a variety of dues from the peasant, but were often considerate in times of need. Now, under the British, the peasant was directly exposed to over-assessment of revenue and inflexible methods of collection. There was no longer any guarantee that, in times of hardship or crop failure, the revenue demand of the state would be reduced, or collection postponed, or that in times of festivities, the peasant would get the loan and support that the Talakta had earlier provided. In areas like Awad, where assistance during 1857 was intense and long lasting, the fighting was carried out by Talaktas and their peasants. Many of these Talaktas were loyal to the Nawab of Awad, and they joined Begum Hazrat Mahal, the wife of the Nawab. In luck now to fight the British, some even remained with her in defeat. The grievances of the peasants were carried over into the Sepoy line since a vast majority of the Sepoys were recruited from the villages of Awad. For decades, the Sepoys had complained of low levels of pay and the difficulty of getting leave. By the 1850s, there were other reasons for their discontent. The relationship of the Sepoys with their superior white officers underwent a significant change. In the years preceding, the uprising of 1857. In the 1820s, white officers made it a point to maintain friendly relations 
with the sepoys. They would take part in their leisure activities. They wrestled with them, fenced with them, and went out hawking with them. Many of them were fluent in Hindustani and were familiar with the customs and culture of the country. These officers were disciplinarian and father figure rolled into one. In the 1840s, this began to change. The officers developed a sense of superiority and started treating the sepoys as their racial inferiors, riding roughshod over their sensibilities. Abuse and physical violence became common and thus, the distance between sepoys and officers grew. Trust was replaced by suspicion. The episode of the greased cartridges was a classic example of this. 300 page number. It is also important to remember that close links existed between the sepoys and the rural world of North India. The large majority of the sepoys of the Bengal army were recruited from the villages of Awad and eastern Uttar Pradesh. Many of them were Brahmins or from the upper castes. Awad was, in fact, called the nursery of the Bengal army. Army, army, the changes that the families of the sepoys saw around them and the threats they perceived were quickly transmitted to the sepoy lines. In turn, the fears of the sepoys about the new cartridge, their grievances about leave, their grouse, about the increasing misbehavior and racial abuse on the part of their white officers were communicated back to the villages. This link between the sepoys and the rural world had important implications in the course of the uprising. When the sepoys defied their superior officers and took up arms, they were joined very swiftly by their brethren in the villages. Everywhere, peasants poured into towns and joined the soldiers and the ordinary people of the towns in collective acts of rebellion. 3. What the rebels wanted as victors, the British recorded their own trials and tribulations as well as their heroism. They dismissed the rebels as a bunch of ungrateful and barbaric people. The repression of the rebels also meant silencing of their voice. Few rebels had the opportunity of recording their version of events. Moreover, most of them were sepoys and ordinary people who were not literate. Thus, other than a few proclamations and ishtas, notifications, issued by rebel leaders to propagate their ideas and persuade people to join the revolt, we do not have much. That throws light on the perspective of the rebels, attempts to reconstruct what happened in 1857 are thus heavily and inevitably dependent on what the British wrote. While these sources reveal the minds of officials, they tell us very little about what the rebels wanted. Page number 301, 3.1. The vision of unity, unity. The rebel proclamations in 1857 repeatedly appealed to all sections of the population, irrespective of their caste and creed. Many of the proclamations were issued by Muslim princes or in their names, but even these took care to address the sentiments of Hindus. The rebellion was seen as a war in which both Hindus and Muslims had equally to lose or gain. The Aishtas harked back to the pre-British Hindu-Muslim past and glorified the coexistence of different communities under the Mughal Empire. The proclamation that was issued under the name of Bahadur Shah appealed to the people to join the fight under the standards of both Muhammad and Mahavir. It was remarkable that, during the uprising religious divisions, between Hindus and Muslim, were hardly noticeable, despite British attempts to create such divisions. In Bareilly, in western Uttar Pradesh, in December, 1857, the British spent hours 50,000 to incite the Hindu population against the Muslims. The attempt failed. Source 5, the Azamgarh Proclamation, the 25th of August, 1857. This is one of the main sources of our knowledge about what the rebels wanted. It is well known to all that, in this age the people of Hindustan, both Hindus and Mohammedans, are being ruined under the tyranny and the oppression of the infidel and treacherous English. It is therefore the bounden duty of all the wealthy people of India, especially those who have any sort of connection with the Mohammedan royal families and are considered the pastors and masters of their people to stake their lives and property for the well-being of the public. Several of the Hindu and Muslim chiefs, who have long since quitted their homes for the preservation of their religion and have been trying their best to root out the English in India, have presented themselves to me and taken part in the reigning Indian crusade, and it is more than probable that I shall very shortly receive succors from the West. Therefore for the information of the public, the present Aishtar, consisting of several sections, is put in circulation, and it is the imperative duty of all to take into their careful consideration 
and abide by it. Parties anxious to participate in the common cause, but having no means to provide for themselves, shall receive their daily subsistence from me, and be it known to all that the ancient works, both of the Hindus and Mohammedans, the writings of miracle workers, and the calculation of the astrologers, pundits, all agree in asserting that the English will no longer have any footing in India or elsewhere. All agree in asserting that the English will no longer have any footing in India or elsewhere, therefore it is incumbent on all to give up the hope of the continuation of the British sway, side with me, and deserve the consideration of the Badshahi or imperial government, by their individual exertion in promoting the common good, and thus attain their respective ends, otherwise if this golden opportunity slips away, they will have to repent for their folly. Number 302. Section 1. Regarding Zamindas, it is evident that the British government in making the emendary settlements have imposed exorbitant tumus revenue demand and have disgraced and ruined several Zamindas by putting up their estates for public auction for arrears of rent, insomuch in the institution of a suit by a common right, a maid servant or a slave, the respectable Zamindas are summoned into court, arrested put in goal and disgraced. In litigation regarding Zamindaris, the immense value of stamps, and other unnecessary expenses of the civil courts, are all calculated to impoverish the litigants. Besides this, the coffers of the Zamindas are annually taxed with the subscription for schools, hospitals, roads, etc. Such extortions, will have no manner of existence, in the Badshahi government, but on the contrary, the Jumas will be light, the dignity and honor of the Zamindas safe, and every Zaminda will have absolute rule in his own emendary. Section the second regarding merchants. It is plain that, the infidel and treacherous, British government have monopolized, the trade of all the fine and valuable merchandise, such as indigo, cloth, and other articles of shipping, leaving only the trade of trifles to the people. Besides this, the profits of the traders are taxed, with postages, tolls and subscriptions for schools, etc. Notwithstanding, all these concessions, the merchants are liable to imprisonment, and disgrace at the instance or complaint of a worthless man. When the Badshahi government is established, all these aforesaid, fraudulent practices, shall be dispensed with, and the trade of every article, without exception, both by land and water will be open to the native merchants of India. It is therefore the duty of every merchant to take part in the war, and aid the Badshahi government, with his men and money. Section the third regarding public servants. It is not a secret thing, that under the British government, natives employed, in the civil and military services, have little respect, low pay, and no manner of influence, and all the posts of dignity and emolument in both the departments are exclusively bestowed, on Englishmen, therefore, all the natives in the British, service ought, to be alive to their religion and interest, and abjuring, their loyalty to the English, side with the Badshahi government, and obtain salaries of 200 and 300 rupees a month for the present, and be entitled to hub posts in the future. Page number, 302. Section 4, regarding artisans. It is evident that the Europeans, by the introduction of English articles into India, have thrown the weavers, the cotton dressers, the carpenters, the blacksmiths, and the shoemakers, etc., out of employ, and have engrossed their occupations, so that, every description of native artisan, artisan has been reduced to beggary. But under the Badshahi government, the native artisans will exclusively be employed, in the service of the kings, the rajas, and the rich, and this will no doubt, ensure their prosperity. Therefore these artisans, or two, renounce the English services. Section 5, regarding pundits, fakirs, and other learned persons. The pundits and fakirs being the guardians of the Hindu, and Mohammedan religions respectively, and the Europeans being the enemies of both the religions, and as at present a war is raging, against the English on account of religion, the pundits and fakirs, are bound to present themselves to me, and take their share in the holy war. What are the issues against British rule highlighted in this proclamation? 
Read the section on each social group carefully. Notice the language in which the proclamation is formulated and the variety of sentiments it appeals to. Page number 303, source 6. What the sepoys thought this is one of the outsis, petition or application, of rebel sepoys that have survived. A century ago the British arrived in Hindustan, and gradually entertained troops in their service, and became masters of every state. Our forefathers have always served them, and we also entered their service, by the mercy of God, and with our assistance the British also conquered every place they liked, in which thousands of us, Hindustani men were sacrificed, but we never made any excuses or pretenses nor revolted. But in the year 1857 the British issued an order that new cartridges and muskets which had arrived from England were to be issued, in the former of which the fats of cows and pigs were mixed, and also that tar of wheat mixed with powdered bones was to be eaten, and even distributed them in every regiment of infantry, cavalry and artillery. They gave these cartridges to the sowers, mounted soldiers, of the third light cavalry, and ordered them to bite them. The troopers objected to it, and said that they would never bite them, for if they did, their religion and faith would be destroyed. Upon this the British officers paraded the men of the three regiments and having prepared 1,400 English soldiers, and other battalions of European troops and horse artillery, surrounded them, and placing six guns before each of the infantry regiments, loaded the guns with grape and made 84 new troopers prisoners and put them in jail with irons on them. The reason that the sours of the cantonment were put into jail was that we should be frightened into biting the new cartridges. On this account we and all our countrymen having united together, have fought the British for the preservation of our faith, we have been compelled to make war for two years, and the rajas and chiefs who are with us in faith and religion, are still so, and have undergone all sorts of trouble. We have fought for two years in order that our faith and religion may not be polluted. If the religion of a Hindu or Muslim is lost, what remains in the world? Compare the reasons for the mutiny as stated in the Azi with those mentioned by the Talukdar. 3.2 Against the symbols of oppression the proclamations completely rejected everything associated with British rule or Firangi Raj as they called it. They condemned the British for the annexations they had carried out and the treaties they had broken. The British, the rebel leaders said, could not be trusted. What enraged the people was how British land revenue settlements had dispossessed landholders, both big and small, and foreign commerce had driven artisans, unweavers to ruin. Every aspect of British rule was attacked and the Firangi accused of destroying a way of life that was familiar and cherished. The rebels wanted to restore that world. The proclamations expressed, the widespread fear, that the British were bent on destroying, the caste and religions of Hindus and Muslims, and converting them to, Christianity, a fear that led people to, believe many of the rumors, that circulated at the time. People were urged to come together, and fight, to save their livelihood their faith, their honor, their identity, a fight which was for, the, greater public good. As noted earlier, in many places, the rebellion against the British, widened into an attack, on all those, who were seen as allies of the British, or local oppressors, often the rebels deliberately, sought to, humiliate, the elites of a city. In the villages they burned account books, and ransacked, moneylenders, houses. This reflected an attempt, to overturn traditional, hierarchies, rebel against all oppressors. It presents a glimpse of, an alternative vision, perhaps of a, more egalitarian, society. Such a visions, were not articulated, in the proclamations, which sought to unify, all social groups in the fight, against Firangi Raj, 3.3, the search for alternative power, once British rule had collapsed. The rebels in places like Delhi, Lucknow and Kanpur tried to, establish a some kind of, structure of authority and administration. This was, of course, short-lived, but the attempts show that, the rebel leadership wanted to restore, the pre-British world, 
of the 18th century. The leaders went back to the culture of the court. Appointments were made to various posts, arrangements made for the collection of land revenue and the payment of troops, orders issued to stop loot and plunder. Side by side, plans were made to fight battles against the British. Chains of command were laid down in the army. In all this the rebels harked back to the 18th century Mughal world, a world that became a symbol of all that had been lost. The administrative structures established by the rebels were primarily aimed at meeting the demands of war. However, in most cases these structures could not survive the British onslaught. But in Avad, where resistance to the British lasted longest, plans of counter-attack were being drawn up by the Lucknow court and hierarchies of command were in place as late as the last months of 1857 and the early part of 1858. Page number 305 and 306, Source 7, Villagers as Rebels, an officer reporting, from rural Avad, spelt as out, in the following account. Noted, the out people are gradually, pressing down, on the line of communication, from the north, the out people, are villagers, these villagers, are nearly intangible, to Europeans melting, away before them, and collecting again. The civil authorities report these villagers to amount to a very large number of men, with a number of guns. What, according to this account, were the problems, faced by the British, in dealing with, these villagers? For, repression, it is clear from all accounts that, we have of 1857 that, the British did not have an, easy time in putting down the rebellion. Before sending out troops, to reconquer North India. The British passed a series of laws, to help them, quell the insurgency. By a number of acts, passed in May, and June 1857 not only was the whole of North India, put under martial law, but military officers, and even ordinary Britons, were given the power, to try and punish Indians, suspected of rebellion. In other words, the ordinary processes of law, and trial, were suspended and it was put out that, rebellion would have, only one punishment, death. Armed with, these newly enacted, special laws, and the reinforcements, brought in from Britain, the British began the task of, suppressing the revolt. They, like the rebels, recognized the symbolic value of Delhi. The British thus mounted, a two-pronged attack. One force moved from Calcutta, into North India, and the other from the Punjab which was largely peaceful, to reconquer Delhi, British attempts to recover Delhi, began in earnest in early, June 1857, but it was only in late September that, the city was finally captured, the fighting and losses, on both sides, were heavy. One reason for this, was the fact that, rebels from all over North India, had come to Delhi, to defend the capital. In the Ganectic Plain, to the progress of, British reconquest was slow. The forces had to reconquer, the area village by village. The countryside, and the people around, were entirely hostile. As soon as, they began their counter-insurgency, operations, the British realized that, they were not dealing with a merry, mutiny, but an uprising that, had huge popular support. In Avad, for example, a British official called, Forsyth, estimated that, three-fourths of the adult male, population, was in rebellion. The area was brought, under control only in, March 1858, after protracted, fighting. The British used military power, on a gigantic scale. But this was not the only instrument, they used. In large parts of present-day Uttar Pradesh, where big landholders, and peasants, had offered, United resistance, the British tried to break up, the unity by promising, to give back to, the big landholders, their estates. Rebel landholders were dispossessed, and the loyal rewarded. Many landholders died, fighting the British, or they escaped into, Nepal, where they died of illness, or starvation. Fig. 
11.8, Amos Khan, The Delhi Ridge, photographed by, Felice Beato, 1857-58 after 1857, British photographers recorded, innumerable images, of desolation and ruin. Fig. 11.9, Sikandra Bagh, Lucknow, photographed by, Felice Beato, 1858, here we see, four solitary figures, within a, desolate place, that was once, the pleasure garden, built by, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah. British forces led by, Campbell, killed over, 2000 rebel sepoys, who held the place in 1857. The skeletons, strewn on the ground, are meant to be a cold warning, of the futility, of rebellion. 5. Images of the revolt, how do we know, about the revolt, about the activities of, the rebels and, the measures of repression, that we have been discussing? As we have seen, we have very few records, on the rebels, point of view. There are a few rebel, proclamations, and notifications, as also some letters, that rebel leaders wrote. But historians still, now have continued, to discuss, rebel actions primarily through, accounts written by the British, official accounts, of course, abound, colonial administrators and military men, left their versions, in letters and diaries, autobiographies, and official histories. We can also gauge, the official mindset, and the changing British attitudes, through the innumerable memos, and notes, assessments of situations, and reports that, were produced. Many of these, have now been collected, in a set of volumes on, mutiny records. These tell us about, the fears and anxieties of, officials and their perception of the rebels. The stories of the revolt, that were published in, British newspapers and magazines, narrated in goody detail, the violence of the mutineers, and these stories inflamed, public feelings and provoked demands of retribution and revenge. One important record, of the mutiny is, the pictorial images, produced by the British, and Indians, paintings, pencil drawings, etchings, posters, cartoons, bazaar prints. Let us look at, some of them and see, what they tell us. 5.1, Celebrating the Saviors, British pictures offer, a variety of images that, were meant to provoke, a range of different emotions, and reactions. Some of them, commemorate, the British heroes, who saved the English and repressed the rebels. Relief of Lucknow, painted by Thomas Jones Parker, in 1859, is an example of this type. When the rebel forces, besieged Lucknow, Henry Lawrence, the commissioner of Lucknow, collected the Christian population, and took refuge, in the heavily fortified, residency. Lawrence was killed, but the residency continued to be defended, under the command of Colonel Inglis, on 25 September James Outram, and Henry Havelock, arrived, cut through the rebel forces, and reinforced the British garrisons, 20 days later Colin, Campbell, who, who was appointed as the new commander, of British forces in India, came with his forces, and rescued, the besieged British garrison, in British accounts, the siege of Lucknow, became a story of survival, heroic resistance, and the ultimate triumph, of British power. Barker's painting, celebrates the moment of, Campbell's entry. At the center of the canvas, are the British heroes, Campbell, Outram, and Havelock. The gestures of the hands, of those around lead the spectator's eyes, towards the center, the heroes stand on a ground, that is well lit, with shadows, in the foreground, and the damaged residency, in the background. The dead and injured in the foreground, are testimony, to the suffering during the siege, while the triumphant figures, of horses in the middle ground, emphasize the fact that, British power and control had been re-established. To the British public such paintings were reassuring. They created a sense that, the time of trouble was past, and the rebellion was over, the British were the victors. 5.2 English women, and the honor of Britain, newspaper reports, have a power over public imagination, they shape feelings and attitudes, to events. 
inflamed particularly by tales of violence against women and children. There were public demands in Britain for revenge and retribution. The British government was asked to protect the honor of innocent women and ensure the safety of helpless children. Artists expressed as well as shaped these sentiments through their visual representations of trauma and suffering. In memoriam, figure 11.11 .11 was painted by Joseph Noel Patton two years after the mutiny. You can see English women and children huddled in a circle, looking helpless and innocent, seemingly waiting for the inevitable dishonor, violence, and death. In memoriam, does not show gory violence, it only suggests it. It stirs up the spectator's imagination and seeks to provoke anger and fury. It represents the rebels as violent and British, even though they remain invisible in the picture. In the background you can see the British rescue forces arriving as saviors. Page number 310 In another set of sketches and paintings, we see women in a different light. They appear heroic, defending themselves against the attack of rebels. Miss Wheeler, in figure 11.12 .11 stands firmly at the center, defending her honor, single-handedly killing the attacking rebels. As in all such British representations, the rebels are demonized. Here, four bully males with swords and guns are shown attacking a woman. The woman's struggle to save her honor and her life, in fact, is represented as having a deeper religious connotation. It is a battle to save the honor of Christianity. The book lying on the floor is the Bible. 5. Three Vengeance and Retribution as waves of anger and shock spread in Britain, demands for retribution grew louder. Visual representations and news about the revolt created a milieu in which violent repression and vengeance was seen as both necessary and just. It was as if justice demanded that the challenge to British honor and power be met ruthlessly. Threatened by the rebellion, the British felt that they had to demonstrate their invincibility, in one such image, fig, where we end where we end dot where we end three, we see an allegorical female, figure of justice with a sword, in one hand, and a shield in the other. Her posture is aggressive, her face expresses rage, and the desire for revenge. She is trampling sepoys under her feet, while a mass of Indian women, with children cower with fear. There were innumerable, other pictures and cartoons in the British press that sanctioned brutal repression and violent reprisal. Page number 311. 5.4 The performance of terror, the urge for vengeance and retribution, was expressed in the brutal way in which the rebels were executed, they were blown from guns or hanged from the gallows. Images of these executions were widely circulated through popular journals. 5.5, no time for clemency, at a time, when the clamor, was for vengeance, pleas for moderation, were ridiculed. When Governor General, Canning declared that, a gesture of, leniency and a show of mercy, would help in winning back, the loyalty of the sepoys, he was mocked, in the British press. In one of the cartoons, published in the pages of Punch, a British journal of comic satire, Canning is shown, as a looming father figure, with his protective hand, over the head, of a sepoy, who still holds an unsheathed sword, in one hand and, a dagger in the other, both dripping with blood, fig. where we end where we end. where we end 7, an imagery that, recurs in a number of British pictures of the time. Page number, 313. 5.6 Nationalist Images, the national movement, in the 20th century, drew its inspiration, from the events of 1857. A whole world of nationalist imagination, was woven around, the revolt. It was celebrated as the first war of independence, in which all sections of the people, of India came to Githi, to fight against imperial rule. Art and literature, as much as the writing of history, 
have helped in keeping alive the memory of 1857. The leaders of the revolt were presented as heroic figures, leading the country into battle, rousing the people to righteous indignation against oppressive imperial rule. Heroic poems were written about the valor of the queen, who, with a sword in one hand and the reins of her horse in the other, fought for the freedom of her motherland. Rani of Chansi was represented as a masculine figure, chasing the enemy, slaying British soldiers and valiantly fighting till her last. Children in many parts of India grew up reading the lines of Subhadra Kumari Chaihan. Kublari Madani Votu Chansi Vali Rani thi. Like a man she fought, she was the Rani of Chansi. In popular prints, Rani Lakshmi Bai is usually portrayed in battle armor, with a sword in hand, and riding a horse, a symbol of the determination to resist injustice and alien rule. The images indicate how the painters who produced them perceived those events, what they felt, and what they sought to convey. Through the paintings and cartoons, we know about the public that looked at the paintings, appreciated or criticized the images and bought copies and reproductions to put up in their homes. These images did not only reflect the emotions and feelings of the times in which they were produced. They also shaped sensibilities. Fed by the images that circulated in Britain, the public sanctioned the most brutal forms of repression of the rebels. On the other hand, nationalist images of the revolt helped shape the nationalist imagination.